Hi, everybody. Welcome to the sustainable innovation session for the summer school. Um, Adrian Ely and myself are going to be talking about grassroots pathways through technological society. And in talking about this, we're going to be drawing on um, a number of different research activities we've done over the years in the STEP Centre in collaboration with partners in some of the um, the international hubs and, and consortium that we've been involved in. And we'll we'll mention these as we go through. Um, and the idea really is to try and um, begin by perhaps characterizing a little bit or, or thinking about conventional approaches to innovation or how sustainable innovation is being approached um, in a very kind of um, high technology sort of way. And then we want to move into thinking about whether there are other pathways for doing innovation or how other approaches to innovation can open up different pathways towards different kinds of sustainability in the future. And we're going to illustrate that with a couple of case studies from some of the steps research that we've done. Um, and then we'll use those and some of the observations from those case studies to uh, think a little bit at the end about how policymakers or um, activists and civil society or, or entrepreneurs might be able to support and help strengthen some of these sort of grassroots approaches to doing innovation and finding grassroots path pathways through what we're calling technological society. Okay. And Adrian and I will be will be taking turns on on how we we present this. So um, so beginning with maybe what you might think about if you mention innovation and uh, a sort of popular image of things to do with innovation is it's to do with technology. Okay. And we've got three examples here of sort of where uh, certainly a lot of innovation policy effort and a lot of investment in innovation, you know, billions and billions of dollars is being invested in, for example, uh, smart industry, industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. So taking ad advantage of advances in things like machine learning and big data, artificial intelligence, uh, advances in uh, internet of things and digital platforms and also advances in things like material science and biotechnology to enhance the control that um, manufacturing and production platforms have over materials and resources, including natural resources, to, to manufacture things through global logistics systems and, su and supply chains and to be very responsive to the market and to consumers. Okay. And those sorts of ideas, you know, very much sort of ideas around automation, computation and control are quite dominant in, in those approaches. And we see them spreading out from sectors like manufacturing, where there's been developed in this vein and innovation in this vein for many years, moving into other areas. So even into agriculture and ideas around smart farming 4.0, uh, again, using uh, digital technologies, uh, sensors, uh, computation, things like drones to treat farming very much like a kind of cyber physical system where you can monitor moisture levels and be much more intelligent on when and how you apply uh, herbicides, for example, or fertilizers and have much enhanced control and therefore productivity gains in farming. And again, there's lots and lots of innovative activity and many national innovation policies are, are um, trying to encourage and to promote this kind of intensive, knowledge intensive and technology intensive forms of agriculture. And then another example area, if you like, is, uh, is cities and urbanization and the, the sort of innovation that's trying to promote the smart city and how, again, uses of digital technologies, real time big data about urban dynamics can enable city managers to better um, uh, respond to issues and developments in the city and run cities much more efficiently, okay? And, and open up new kinds of sources of competitiveness maybe with other cities, become more attractive places for residents and for 
entrepreneurs and companies to come and locate thanks to the sorts of smart city technologies and things like you know being able to look at um, get real-time information about bus services spaces where you might park your car information about um, the, the maintenance of urban infrastructures as well what state they're in maybe when the parks through moisture sensors need watering and, and these sorts of things and a lot of these sorts of efficiencies and enha enhanced controls in what we might call technological society 4.0 everything sort of 4.0 taking advantage of this fourth wave of, of industrial innovation um spills into a and, and the argument is that sustainability can be achieved through enhanced control and that these innovations will allow us to use or allow the owners of the technologies to engage in businesses or provide social services in ways that are much more efficient and sparing in their use of resources okay and we'll have better understanding of resources we'll be able to close production loops and build circular economies and so on and so forth but there's some issues here about this dominant approach or some characteristics that maybe are, are reasons for us to pause and think a little bit, if you like, and, 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 and question whether this is the best way to be going about innovation and organising innovation in societies and investing in it. A lot of it is proprietary technology fixes being used or claimed to fix what are social problems. These technologies are certainly very disruptive on the surface at least, but maybe actually they're really quite conservative. What um, an engineer Mike Cooley many years ago called present tense technologies in the sense that they are future technologies or advanced technologies, but their design and their application and use and their investment is being informed by current economic practices. It's being shaped by current power relations in society. And that these technologies are actually about conserving those arrangements. Okay, rather than being genuinely transformational. And perhaps starting with technology kind of dazzles us a little bit and makes us overlook some quite important social questions when it comes to innovation and choosing different pathways or assuring there's a plurality of pathways to sustainability. You know, who will thrive in these societies and who will be marginalised? It's interesting when you look at images like these that often people aren't even in the, the picture or they're very marginal to the, the systems maps and the, the, the technologies. But there are important social questions there. And there are also questions about to what extent these are portrayed as universal fixes for worlds that are quite diverse and dynamic and plural. This is presented as a solution for kind of any place. Whereas, you know, when we start looking at how these technologies are being implemented, they don't work in the same ways in every place and they're not always appropriate to many places around the world. So what's missing? What kind of place-based considerations are missing in these universalized pathways? And, and can innovation be done differently? Okay, so that's the sort of what we're gonna be getting into uh, in this lecture. But I just wanna dig a little bit deeper with this slide into the drivers of this dominant pathway and a, a, a really important feature I think in the technological society 4.0 is the question of automation so using technologies to um, automate processes and with the idea of giving us enhanced control okay and the idea is that to use these technologies around automation but others as well is the idea is to adapt societies to preconceived ideas about what the best technological solution is okay so we have the technology vision and then a lot of the policy work and the debate is how to adapt societies so that they can benefit from uh these technological visions so that they can be manifested in in successfully in in our societies and this has been a dynamic that's been around for for decades it precedes a lot of the current excitement and interest around industry 4.0 farming 4.0 smart cities and so forth you know, going back to the 1960s, um, engineers like Liam Bagrett were talking about the age of automation and explaining how automation is a concept through which you know, the machine system is caused to operate with maximum efficiency 
by means of adequate measurement, observation and control of its behaviour. It involves a detailed and continuous knowledge of the functioning of the system so that the best corrective actions can be applied immediately they become necessary. So there's some really important kind of key words in there around control, around efficiency, around observation and kind of real-time adaptation to a system, perceived as a system, okay? And key to that are thing, technological affordances and innovative skills around computation, communication and control, okay? So currently, quite recently, this is being um, promoted and invested in and developed under the rubric of the fourth industrial Re revolution. I mentioned that uh, uh, in the preceding slides. And if you like some of the underlying logics, the foundations for this pathway are things like managerial control. These systems allow managers to control processes and to control um, people involved in them processes much more efficiently and effectively. That's the part of the promise. The idea is to enhance labor productivity. Okay, so the, the kind of human effort, the human work that goes into these systems um, can generate much far greater outputs for each unit of, of, uh, of labor that goes into it. That's another important driver for the fourth industrial revolution. And because we're in uh, uh, capitalist societies, an important aspect of this is the, uh, in, the necessity to accumulate capital, okay, to kind of keep profits up and to reinvest in further technology and further capital in order to keep the, the, the profit rates kind of coming in, if you like. Now, what's interesting is, on, and that's very much, I don't know, a project on the political right, you could say. What's interesting is that on the political left as well, there's a kind of um, radical commitment to accelerating automation, to accelerating these technologies and bringing forth these sorts of societies. But there the hope is that somehow they, that acceleration can lead to a social transformation. So labor productivity can be turned into liberating people from needless toil, okay? Um, and if you like, it's about seizing these innovative dynamics under the rubric of fully automated luxury communism, for example, to uh, and having much greater state control and social regulation over these technologies, not to kind of uh, uh, to take ownership and benefit from them. Concerns about um, technological unemployment and uh, sharing out the the, the super abundant uh, productivities that will come from these systems is to be. Uh, used to provide universal basic services and income for people, okay? So everyone gets to share in the economic uh, growth and benefits of these systems. And so promoting, a rather than sort of capital accumulation per se, the argument is to promote post-scarcity technology acceleration, okay? So you can look at uh, and read um, kind of debates, if you like, all about how best to adapt societies to technological innovation, if you like. Now, these may be quite kind of um, extreme examples or um, uh, quite thoroughgoing commitments to technological society 4.0 or but it's really to make this point that, that this seems this is where a lot of the um, debate and argument around innovation is if you like and when it comes to sustainability both share this idea of ecological modernization through these cyber physical systems, okay? So enhanced understanding of the natural world enables us to manage it better, to use it for raw materials in these manufactured worlds much more efficiently and so forth. Now, of course, there can be a number of anxieties and I'm sure you're familiar with you know, debates in public discourse, in the media, concerns about these sort of pathways for innovation, technology-based innovation. And here's some of the kinds of concerns listed under each here. There are concerns about unemployment. What, what will work will people do if these visions are, are realized? There are concerns that um, there will be concentrations of power thanks to those who own the platforms or uh, the, the knowledge and, um, uh, and treat it as a proprietary kind of resource for, for their business activities. 
There are questions about energy and data dependency, um, whether the goods to keep the system running, if you like, there's accelerated um, flow throughs of goods and consumption and intensify, intensification of consumption. There's a questions of democracy and whether these more technological approaches to innovation privilege some social groups, those most closely involved and benefiting from the innovation, they have more power over deciding what the future is going to look like. Okay, so there are many issues associated with this, this dominant approach, if you like, and about just how sustainable is it going to be, or what forms of sustainability may arise from that. Okay, so if you like, that's with these slides, I've been trying to paint you a picture of um, some important and powerful trajectories in innovation. But there's a question, some of the research we've been doing in the STEP Centre has been wondering if we can do innovation differently and looking at what we call kind of more grassroots approaches to innovation or grassroots innovations in a number of different sectors and places. Um, and the ones we're going to talk about ones that maybe connect in some way or, or take some of these, some of the devices or practices of technological society 4.0, but take them off in a very different direction and engage the, um, those practices with quite different assumptions to the fore and very different sort of social values. So maybe not so um, uh, much emphasis on labor productivity, managerial control, and an emphasis instead on other values about collabor enabling collaboration between humans, treating these technologies less as a proprietary good and more as a commons and so forth. Okay, and we'll get into that with some of our examples. But in this research, you can look, so if you look below the radar and away from the dominant sort of policy debates about technological innovation and um, sustainability and the future societies, you can see in neighborhoods, in um, uh, villages, you know, online, uh, at meetups and so forth, a wealth of activity where people are trying to approach uh, innovation or doing innovative things quite differently. And that can involve technology, but it can also just involve more like social practices as we'll see uh, in a moment. But some of the differences, if you like, compared to the, the opening slide, is that here, the technologies and the activities are seen more as a commons, a commons involving commons-based peer production is one of the terms they use. So the idea that the knowledge that's being produced and the activity of creating more sustainable activities or more socially relevant um, uh, products and goods and services is done as a common endeavor, is open to people, um, people can participate and adapt it, but then any adaptations have to be made available to others within kind of shared rules of, of, of who qualifies for access and under what terms. Okay, so there's a new way of working, if you like, in innovation that's quite different to the more um, proprietary and competitive based forms of innovation or, or innovation partnerships, maybe between business and the state, but with a view to um, uh, commodifying those innovations in proprietary goods or proprietary forms of knowledge. There's been tremendous work around digital, using digital technologies for social innovation activities and for things like citizen sensing and monitoring environments and making visible our relations with uh, non-human beings and different ecosystems through citizen science and using sensors of various types. Okay, so trying to spread awareness and new relations with um, uh, in socio-ecological systems, if you like. There's the activities and initiatives that emphasize rather than the acceleration of turnovers of technologies, they're more interested in designing and adapting technologies so that they're easier to fix, to repair, and that they're durable, and that they enable um, activities or the consumption or use of, of goods and services that's much more durable. So not this constant um, escalation of, of upgrades and so forth, okay? Other examples of activities are things like um, 
what we might call techno-political platforms and platform cooperatives. So rather than sort of gig economy digital platforms, for example, thinking about how through um, commons-based approaches, platforms can be developed that allow citizens to debate and engage in um, uh, participate in urban governance, for example, through online fora and through voting. So there are examples of platforms where citizens get to you know, decide on how city budgets are spent, but also um, platforms where the, the, the workers own the platform and form cooperatives and use the platform to help them organize and engage in economic activities. And of course, activists very much make use of digital media, uh, labor rights organizations and so forth. And then there's also really interesting work going on in places beyond the centers of innovation, where the visions for smart cities and industry 4.0 uh, arise, if you like, and thinking about um, how to decolonize technology or how to promote technologies in ways that are more sensitive and appropriate and, and come from diverse cultures in different parts of the world, okay? How to develop or make use of these technologies in ways that, um, um uh what's the word sort of re not reinforce but 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 um strengthen or um bring added dynamic added um qualities to uh to cut to cultures okay and what's interesting i think about all of these sorts of examples and we'll illustrate them a bit more in a moment with our two case studies is that this is very much about opening up futures. Whereas technological society 4.0 comes with quite kind of broadly established visions of what the future is going to be like. These will be the technologies and these will be how economies work. And this is how we will live in cities and so forth. Here the emphasis is in these grassroots activities about almost like prototyping or tinkering or coming up being quite experimental with these technologies and figuring out what sort of futures may be viable or open up in a much more plural way. What we're developing through these sorts of activities and these movements or um, networks of social entrepreneurship and so forth is, is we're redistributing really important prototyping capabilities in societies. You know, what's going on here, if you like. And through that, reasons this is interesting to us in the step center is because obviously with the pathways approach we want to explore different pathways to different forms of sustainable development okay we uh, will come back to this but some of the work around in the step center around the new manifesto was about how to promote more diverse and distributed capabilities in societies for opening up a plurality of pathways that, that can take us in different directions for sustainability, okay? Maybe even, given that the dominant pathway seems so invested in automation, might some of these pathways be conceived as sort of post-automation pathways to sustainability, okay? What different sorts of sustainabilities open up? So on that note, I will uh, invite Adrian in to illustrate some of these uh, themes with the, the first example. So Adrian, over to you. Thanks very much, Adrian. So, uh, yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, my example that I'm going to be introducing draws upon work that's been conducted in the Pathways to Sustainability Consortium, primarily by a small team in the UK. And I've been working in particular with Elise Bach on that, and also colleagues in Argentina, big uh, team of colleagues over there, but Annabelle Marin, Paddy Van Swanenberg, and Almendra Kremaski have been um, particularly uh, central that work. And this has looked in different ways at seeds, and in particular alternative visions and models for seeds that are related to this idea of commons-based peer production that Adrian mentioned before, and initiatives that have drawn inspiration and ideas from uh, open source movements in software. So just to um, talk a bit about seeds, Seeds, as you probably know, they're of uh, vital importance in terms of their uh, as being an input to agriculture. But beyond that, they're really the basis of food security, uh, the source of diversity and resilience within agri-food systems. Um, and 
Some people would even argue that um, seeds and their domestication over the last 10,000 years or so has really formed the basis of um, development and the, the patterns of development and civilization that we have seen emerge over that period. So we have a really long history of um, domestication and as you could say, innovation within seeds. Back to uh, domestication of emma wheat in the Fertile Crescent 9,000 years ago uh, in China, um, broom corn millet or, and foxtail millet and in Africa, finger millet, as well as other um, plants like coffee and teff. Uh, in South America, a whole range of um, species domesticated, including maize, beans and squash, and uh, taro and yam domesticated in Papua New Guinea. Just some of the examples of this uh, long history of innovation within uh, seeds and interaction between humans and seeds that have um, shaped the um, environments and societies that uh, we now live in. Um, but that pattern of innovation has really changed uh, greatly over the last century or so. And that's primarily been, or at least partly been, as a result of a wider exchange of uh, seeds and biodiversity across um, countries, but also the institutions around seed innovation and primarily those institutions related to ownership and intellectual property, the other theme that, one of the other themes that Adrian mentioned earlier. So what we've got here is a quote from two seed breeders from about 100 years ago, um, Easton Jones book in 1919. They said, the man who originates devices to open our boxes of shoe polish or to autograph our camera negatives is able to patent his product and gain the full reward for his inventiveness. The man who originates a new plant which may be of incalculable benefit to the whole country gets nothing, not even fame for his pains as the plants can be propagated by anyone. So there was an absence, as they saw it, in ownership and in the ability of innovators or inventors to um, appropriate the benefits that, aro that arose from their um, activities. <clears throat> and um, technologists um, began to uh, identify ways around this. So not that long after 1919, hybrid seeds, hybrid corn was being invented, which uh, incentivized um, farmers to actually buy new seed each year in order to get very high, um, in, in order to benefit from hybrid, hybrid vigor and um, reach um, better yields. But there were also different institutions as well as technology. So the Plant Patenting Act in the USA in 1930 first um, allowed patents on, in that case, asexually reproducing plants. But the um, idea of ownership around seeds, around varieties, uh, and intellectual property around this form of nature, what was pre uh, previously not the ownership of any one individual, extended through the Plant Variety Protection Act, and indeed the application of utility patents on plants in the US. Um, so that um, really took off from the 1980s and 90s, following on from the famous uh, Diamond versus Chakrabarti case, which is often seen as the first uh, case in which the precedent was set for patents on life, as, as they've now been referred to. Um, now this um, approach, this march of intellectual property into the biological domain has differed across the world, but the model and the precedent set in the US has, has at least to some extent been extended across the world through um, the World Trade Organization um, Agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property, the TRIPS Agreement. Over here in the EU, we've had a slightly different story. I say here in the EU, um, the UK is no longer in the EU. Nevertheless, the story I'm about to tell is from the period when we were 
Um, and we had the European Patent Convention in 1973, and then the Biotech Patent Directive, uh, which, was, um, which came out in 1998. Now in Europe, there's been um, a recognition really, uh, which was um, emphasized in a European Parliament resolution in 2012, that um, any products that um, rely on essentially biological processes or natural processes cannot be patented. Um, that there was the, the European Parliament resolved that in 2012, but since then the European Patent Office has started to award patents on um, uh, plants. And those are not only um, GM, transgenic, but also um, products of conventional breeding. And there's been a real controversy over the last few years in Europe about whether or not products that are um, produced through essentially biological processes can be patented. And it's gone round in circles. The most recent announcement of the enlarged Board of Appeal of the European Patent Office reversed its earlier decision and held that plants and animals produced by essentially biological or natural processes are not patentable. Now, countries across the global south um, and outside uh, North America and uh, Europe have had their own debates in these um, very, very fractious uh, areas. Um, one of the countries that I'm going to talk about later, Argentina, um, has allowed certain levels of uh, intellectual property over um, its seeds traditionally, but not um, patents. But in the early stages of when we were doing this work with our Argentinian colleagues, uh, the government over there was moving to, towards the amendment of the seed law, which uh, in a way that would have reduced the rights of farmers to save and exchange seeds and increased the property, uh, the intellectual property protection and ownership over those seeds. The plans at that stage were also uh, to limit uh, uh, the supremacy of the seed law over the patent law. So to move to a stronger form of intellectual property rights. So institutions have changed over the past hundred years uh, in different ways across the, across the world, but they have contributed to uh, the shape of agriculture that we see now. And recent technological changes are look, to, look set to um, shift this uh, towards what Adrian referred to as agriculture 4.0 and a new world um, that we um, that that is is marching ahead with technology and changing institutions. So here you see um, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, um, the two winners of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry last year in 2020 for their work on CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9 which is largely seen as a, a new technological process that enables changes in the genome, not only of plants, but also other organisms, and um, enables new approaches to breeding, as it's, it's seen sometimes, which are not uh, based on essentially biological processes. And so at least in theory can be patented in ways, even in Europe, in ways that um, traditional breeding techniques cannot be. So here the revolution that is foreseen involves synthetic biology, uh, breeding crops for um, new traits, but also introducing completely new um, engineered genes into crops so that they can be used for very different purposes beyond food production in um, medical spheres and, and other industrial spheres. And uh, you know there is a race to commercialize these products and also a race to uh, appropriate intellectual property around them to enclose and to concentrate ownership. Um, and that concentration of ownership is mirrored in other trends that we see. And looking again at the US and uh, the UK, um, we, we see um, entrepreneurs like Bill Gates rushing to buy up farmland Jeff Bezos doing the same, and over here in the UK, entrepreneurs uh, and inventors like James Dyson doing the same, buying up land and also introducing these novel uh, 
some would say revolutionary agricultural techniques in um, as part of this march towards uh, agriculture 4.0. So uh, there is some um, interesting, there are really some interesting phenomena um, that we see shaping agriculture across the world. Now I turn to some of the work that I think um, illustrates some alternatives and look at the work that have, we've done as part of the consortium. And as I said, this is drawing on work in the UK uh, hub and also uh, work from our colleagues in Argentina in the Latin America hub. So in the UK, the example that we've been looking at and the, uh, the, the network that we've been collaborating with uh, revolves around CD Sunday. CD Sunday is an annual event that takes place on the first Sunday in February every year. And it's been going for nearly 20 years and it is the uh, UK's largest and longest running community seed swap. Um, it really emerged uh, as a counterpoint and a response towards uh, these trends around genetic modification and um, enclosure of the seeds commons um, and with a pretty simple idea. And that is the idea that seeds and the genetic diversity embedded within them is actually a, a commons for sharing rather than something that can be owned by any individual or organization. So the main event in CD Sunday, what it really revolves around is what you can see here, the red arrow pointing down, that is the seed swap. And that is when um, growers of all kinds, uh, whether they're you know, smallholders or um, allotment growers or people who grow food in their gardens, bring um, seeds which they've saved from the previous season together and offer them and share them in exchange and with others from across the UK. And in fact, we did a, we helped um, CD Sunday conduct a survey. We actually found that it was people that came from beyond the UK that were um, taking part in the event. But it's grown to uh, extend beyond seeds. There are um, people who come and give talks and there have been talks around um, citizen science initiatives. There are other organizations involved in the conservation of biological diversity in seeds, um, cooperatives involved in um, seed breeding and, uh, and um, exchange and, and retail, and really a, a, an ecosystem of alternatives to that vision uh, that was laid out before around agriculture 4.0. Um, and current discussions around genome editing in Europe uh, are really, um, again, shining a light on those kinds of alternatives. So that's the case study from the UK. In Argentina, our colleagues have been responsible for a really innovative um, and exciting initiative, which is called BioLeft. Now, the Argentinian context um, is also one, you know, very agriculturally based economy with domestic capabilities and seed firms um, that compete with um, multinationals, um, even you know, following the widespread introduction of transgenic um, seeds. Um, and as I said, there were uh, government moves in 2015 or so to change intellectual property around seeds, which our colleagues were involved in, in terms of those debates, they were contributing to those debates. But beyond you know, advocacy, um, and policy engagement, they also um, initiated this um, more um, bottom-up and activist uh, initiative of BioLeft. And what is it? What is BioLeft? Well, BioLeft is really a platform for a new form of uh, seed innovation, and it comprises comprises three elements. The first of this. First of these is a legal tool which draws very much on ideas around copyleft or open source licenses in software, um, but applies them to seeds. An important aspect of this is what's known as a viral clause. This allows seeds and seed varieties to be exchanged um, and even, even sold between individuals, but only on the condition that the seeds themselves can be then used by other breeders to further improve on the seeds. 
Um, and by using a seed that emerged as a result of or through this BioLeft open source platform, um, the, a, a um, breeder is signing up to that viral clause, which continues through the seed to um, ensure that the products of the open innovation platform are freely available for future innovation. That's the legal tool underpinning BioLeft. There's also a digital platform. And so this is a web-based platform that allows the sharing of information uh, that goes alongside the sharing of the seeds themselves and the germplasm uh, itself. Um, beyond that, it also um, enables this third element, organizational innovations around new methods of management, uh, of sharing information, sharing data, but also ideas and responsibilities, uh, which has emerged as BioLeft itself has extended and developed from a relatively small group of um, people within this, within CENIT, within our Argentinian um, partner organization, to a much broader network. Um, so this is uh, just one of these examples that illustrates commons-based peer production. It's production between peers of different kinds, and uh, it, the outcome of that is seen as a commons, a protected commons in this case, because it cannot be patented. It cannot be um, appropriated as a result of this viral clause, but a commons nevertheless. It's um, empowering and supporting an alternative model of seed improvement to the one that is uh, the focus of the Agriculture 4.0 narrative. And it's involving an extended network of researchers, breeders, farmers, and civil society organizations, as well as civil servants, um, with that shared uh, vision in opposition to one of um, privatized uh, biodiversity. And what's really interesting in, in uh, I, I think, in, in BioLeft and more broadly, is that this is just one example of a whole movement uh, across many different countries that are pioneering and experimenting with these alternative approaches to open source seeds. Uh, you see similar um, initiatives with their own characteristics of so slightly different approaches being followed in Austria, France, Italy, East Africa, India, uh, Germany, the USA and the Netherlands, as well as um, other uh, localities. And in fact, these have come together to work in a global coalition of open source seeds initiatives, or GOSI, which um, Annabel Marin, uh, our colleague from Argentina, is uh, centrally involved in as well. So uh, they, these alternatives from the local level to the national level to the international level. And it's not only in seeds. I think another really interesting component here is that uh, these alternatives exist across the agricultural um, sphere. So you also have examples where in um, opposition to privatized knowledge and um, say private sector led innovation or research, we have more um, citizen science approaches. So these examples, Team Pollinate, citizen science project based um, here in Brighton and Hove, which has looked at pollinators in allotments or the GROW Observatory, which is a citizen science approach looking at soil and soil health. We also see wider organizational innovations, for example, around community supported agriculture, about around different models that share risks between producers, farmers, and also consumers, and also um, organizations like the Land Workers Alliance um, coming together to provide a voice for those kinds of alternatives in the UK. Uh, in terms of place-based food strategies, seeking sustainable food, healthy food, and also fair food systems, we also see um, initiatives. And in Brighton and Hope, we've got uh, the Brighton and Hope Food Partnership, which has really um, brought together a whole range of stakeholders to um, think about food at the city level. And uh, they have been working also as part of a wider UK network, the Sustainable Food Places network. So again, local to national, but indeed uh, international networks also pull these different 
um, groups and visions together. So in organic farming, there's IFOAM, it's the International Federa Federation, but also La Via Campesina as an international movement um, resisting uh, agriculture 4.0 and putting forward various different alternatives to it. So that's the first example that we wanted to bring to your attention. I'll hand back to Adrian now to talk further. Great, thank you. Um, our second example, so that was an example we thought that might I don't know, bring to life a little bit these, this, these practices of it, practicing innovation as a common based approach amongst peers. Our second example is connected and related more with um, another realm of where, you know, more open futures and different innovation pathways may be being pursued in relation to digital social innovation and citizen sensing. And the importance, if you like, of mobilizing communities, how technologies can help mobilize communities. It's an example that's set in uh, a smart city or looking at um, doing things with digital technologies in, in smart city, where maybe in contrast to the emphasis on big data and managing cities at a city wide scale, this is about how, if you like, sensing environments and generating data has to become thick in the kind of Clifford Gertz sort of sense in anthropology about thick with social meaning. It has to be situated and located in place in, in order for that data to try and mobilize communities and make things happen. And this case study um, draws on some research we did in Barcelona, which for many years was uh, at the top of the, the world rankings for smart cities. They had a mayor, uh, the previous mayor, very much committed to making the city of Barcelona um, uh, highly connected. There were districts that were dedicated to um, piloting a lot of smart city interventions. Um, partnerships were struck with um, multinational uh, information technology corporations to try and promote the investment and development of smart devices in and around the city. So there were platforms developed around um, uh, connected to um, public transport, to parking spaces. There was a, uh, a, a platform um, of sensors installed around the city that would provide um, environmental information around noise levels, contamination and rainfall and so forth, okay, called the Centillo platform that could connect to smart city dashboards and help in the management and understanding and generating big data around the, the city. And indeed, the city authorities opened up a lot of information about the city so that third parties could um, access that data to develop apps and services for people as well. So really trying to cultivate a um, kind of innovation system in the city dedicated to uh, promoting smart for reasons of improving people's health or uh, services for the elderly, mobility, uses of public space and so on and so forth. Okay, But our, our story, our case study begins in, uh, is set in one particular square in one part of the city. And this is uh, Plaza del Sol in the Gracia district um, of Barcelona, which over the years has become very popular with visitors and has become an important part of the leisure economy. And as you can see, um, it's a traditional history of being a place where people would come and meet and socialize has sort of intensified over the years and become somewhat entrenched and has actually, what was always um, maybe a pleasant, convivial neighborhood, seen that maybe that's gone a bit too far and these activities generate kind of noise nuisances as well as other inconveniences late into the night. So this is just a, I mean, maybe a feature of many urban settings and a lot of urban politics is about finding convivial uses of space, how different kind of uses of public spaces and so forth can kind of get along. And here's an issue of what um, visitors, uh, young people, people from other neighborhoods, uh, residents, how they make use of the space and how that kind of relates to uh, the residents who live around it, okay, and the sort of neighbourhoods they uh, are accustomed to living in and want to live in. Okay, so that's that's one place within the Barcelona smart city for this, this example, okay. The other place that is important 
is um, Fab Lab Barcelona. So this is in another neighborhood in the city, the neighbor, the district actually that's become, or that was um, uh, chosen to be the smart city district. Okay, um, Aroba Veitidos, I think um, it was it was called probably now uh, known more conventionally. And a Fab Lab is a open workshop for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, where um, equipped with digital design and fabrication technologies. And the emphasis is very much on the sort of commons based peer production approaches to designing and making things that Adrian talks about a little bit in relation to seed. So these are places where people can meet and get involved in projects or share ideas and collaborate in the design of objects and devices and so forth. And that they are, they are networked globally. So the kind of projects you might be starting and experimenting with in one workshop, one fab lab or maker spaces, they're also known as, or hacker spaces. Um, you can connect digitally with video and collaborate and share your designs and your instructions and your experiences with other workshops. And you can collaborate at a distance if you like. Okay. One of the interesting projects developed at fab lab Barcelona was a um, smart citizen citizen sensing device. Okay, so this is very much like an, an open hardware project. It made use of microcontrollers that were cheap and open and readily accessible and adaptable, known as Arduino. And the idea was to develop um, low cost sensors, so a sensor you could buy for twenty dollars or so, and the and that citizens could relatively easily install wherever they wanted and connect that data to the smart citizen platform and share information about what was happening in their environment. Okay, so there are various uh, low cost simple sensors in this device for temperature, humidity, light, nit nitrogen dioxide levels, carbon monoxide, noise and so forth. Okay, and again in the spirit of these this sort of milieu of, of, of making and social entrepreneurship, the development of prototypes and development of this citizen sensing was funded through crowdsourcing. So a number of crowdsourcing campaigns were run to raise money, as you can see in the top left of the slide, to develop the sensor and to develop the web platform that people could connect to over the internet and share their geolocated information. So if you like, rather than the citizen authorities deciding where and how to map environmental information about the city. The idea behind this was that citizens themselves could monitor and measure um, you know, environmental indicators that were of interest to them in locations of interest to them. And again, in keeping with the kind of spirit of, of um, open design and commons, the instructions and software and how to do all this was shared on GitHub, a platform for or repository for this sorts of information. And the, the sensor was sort of launched. Um, people bought it, workshops were run, not just in Barcelona, but around other um, cities. There were partnerships formed with cities like Manchester in the UK. And the sensor sold. And if you um, and slowly the, the the mapping grew, and more and more kind of enthusiasts or people who adopted the technology installed the, the sensor. But if you like, one of the um, features of this was whilst people were installing the sensor, some people found it a bit more complicated to use and install than um, the designers were expecting. Those who could install it and were um, generating data and using it, the kind of interest and enthusiasm tailed off over a period. Um, and that prompted a bit of a rethink about, well, we've, we've developed this nice sort of citizen sensing technology, but what's What's its purpose, if you like? It's it's a sort of is this a technology fix looking for a, a problem to solve? So that prompted a rethink um, and the incorporation into the development, not just of technology um, activists, if you like, and, and, and entrepreneurs, but um, people more skilled in participatory design and community development to raise funds and in the end actually get some social innovation funds from the European Commission to have a rethink. Of, of the project. And what that involved was thinking how to adapt this piece of open hardware and this platform and make it um, relevant 
for a community that already had a matter of concern, if you like. So this is where the community development comes in. And this is where Plaza del Sol in the Gracia neighborhood of Barcelona comes back into the story. So with the research now and this, this, these funds to further develop this sort of um, technology or prototype, the, um, the activists wanted to find a community where some sensing would make sense, if you like, where there was a matter of concern to the um, residents or neighbors. And so having kind of scouted it around and asked, they, they um, found, uh, they identified, you know, Plaza del Sol and this noise nuisance and how noise was intensifying uh, and going late into the night and so forth in the square. And so residents were approached, uh, notices put up around the square, inviting people to get involved into a project where the idea would be to design this technology in a way that it could be used by the residents to measure noise levels around the square. And residents signed up. I'm trying to remember the precise numbers now. I think it might have been uh, in the 20s, 20 households living around the square, attended workshops and over a period of weeks, working with the citizen sensing um, developers, the citizen science developers, understanding the noise problems, understanding the dynamics and things that have been going on in the square. The, the residents got to know one another better. They learned about the technology. The technologists learned how to repackage and redevelop the technology in ways that was um, made sense for the, the householders, if you like. And over a period of months, a, a monitoring campaign was, was developed with the, with the technology they co-developed. OK, so installing sensors on the balconies of the, the apartments overlooking the square, but also inside the apartments as well. And the residents could control what happened with that data. So a platform was developed, not on the web, but um, on um, uh, a dedicated app. And residents could make the, the data they were generating about noise available to the platform if they want, or if they, or maybe they didn't want to, you know, maybe um, uh, things were going on in the flat um where they you know didn't want to share noise data at that point in time and so forth but what was put in place if you like was a network that the residents could use to do their own citizen science projects to monitor and measure noise levels in the square um and what they were doing in that in, by that was um codifying something they already knew about really they knew they lived in a very noisy square and maybe individually they'd been raising uh, complaints and, and issues with the local council, but that had always fallen on, on, on deaf ears. Okay, But now armed with um, some perhaps rudimentary, but with some noise levels data, they could, they could, they codified it and they translated their experience into a form that was more legible or would be listened to by the council. Okay, so that's one thing. But also in doing this in a participatory technological way, it's from a bottom up way, they had incubated a community. The residents had come together and formed a collective. So what had been an individual nuisance living in a flat overlooking a noisy square was now a kind of collective um, endeavor, if you like. So the, 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 the workshops and the face-to-face -face building together of the uh, noise monitoring project and network um, was really important in terms of building that, that, that collective as well. And of course, now armed with the data, they could compare, just they could identify just how noisy their street was over the course of the day, which days were more noisy than others. So weekends, the noise may run on much later into the night, into the early hours of the morning, and so on and so forth. But also with these noise levels, they were able to compare those noise levels with what the scientific research said about the health impacts of noise okay or interrupted sleep and so forth so they could begin to investigate and document if you like some of the um uh and in a uh, in a kind of scientific way a way that would carry weight with the city authorities at the city council um what was going on in the square the stuff that they've been living with for many many years they also wanted to compare how noisy their square was with other places in the city and it's at that point that someone mentioned or they learnt about the Centillo smart city network that I mentioned earlier, this, this platform of, for environmental monitoring across the city that had open data. 
So they looked, they, they, they investigated that and looked up and it turned out that the Centillo platform had sensors, including noise sensors in Plaza del Sol in Gracia and was already measuring noise levels, this council owned platform, but no one had really thought to um, tell the residents about this. Okay, it was only when they'd done their own project that they learned that there was already some noise monitoring going on there. Okay, so they could compare how their kind of, you know, um, their own sensors compared with the the official uh, the official data. And as one of one of the um, residents said to us, so that the big difference is this is my data. You know, I can't take this data away from them. Okay. I said there's something interesting going on here as well. So for the um, for the managers of the smart city, the, the, the Centillo platform, that noise center is just one data point in their um, digital twin of the city, if you like. Okay, so it's just the, the noise levels being measured, the data in Plaza del Sol, Sol is one data point. But obviously, behind that sensor, in the square or beneath it, in the square, for the residents, that data point is symbolic of, of how life has changed in the square over the years, how noise has intensified. Okay, there's a sort of um, thick social world around this data that maybe the smart city platforms and visualizations underestimate to some extent. So what the residents did having with their noise data was to try and mobilize a campaign and support for taking action to try and address noise levels in the square. They organized a citizens assembly in the square over a weekend where they sought ideas and suggestions from fellow residents and from other city citizens from across the city who came and made suggestions and where some of the findings were presented and various other devices for engaging people in noise noise issues and 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 um, having fun in the square were um, all deliberated on and a number of suggestions were made so you know there was I, discussions about whether um, the square can be reformed and remodeled in some ways and actually eventually the council did implement some of these ideas and suggestions and you see some examples here so on the bottom left you can see how some of the steps which were a popular ploit for gathering and sitting were given over to um, plant pots and plants to discourage people from sitting on the, on the steps okay and to sort of change the, 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 the square somewhat architects suggested ways of trying to alter the acoustics in the square there are debates about whether um, the police or community kind of um, officers should come through the square and, and stop people from being noisy or discourage them. And that was seen as perhaps going too far by residents. But notices were put up around the square, as you can see in the top middle there, reminding people that Barcelona is a shared space and trying to respect and be um, quiet um, late into the night. The council also um, agreed to um, uh, bring forward to uh, the, the time at which the city cleaners would come through the street at night. So rather than being in the very, in the early hours of the morning, maybe it'd come through, they'd come through at two o'clock or at midnight in the week to clean the squares. And that would obviously encourage people to move on. A children's playground was put into the square as well to try and um, uh, recover some of the activities that some of the residents recalled about the place being much more um, plural in its uses and friendly to families and so forth. So these are some of the measures, if you'd like, that were mobilized with the help of that um, citizen science, citizen sensing project and activity that I talked about. But as you can see in the bottom picture, the, 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 the problem itself may have been reduced, if you like, and attenuated somewhat, but it hasn't completely gone away. Okay, and maybe that suggests that there are also limits to um, some of these sorts of innovative approaches. Um, and that whilst useful in many ways, um, some additional kind of things need to be wrapped around that. And so that brings me to some of the observations from this example. And so how the, this more participatory approach to technology maybe opened up a, a, a different pathway to urbanism compared to the top down smart city. Maybe so. It's interesting using some of the methods and technology of the smart city, but in quite a different way that involves people much more centrally and and, and allows them to shape, if you like, innovative ways for trying to address urban issues. 
um, in the sense that the technology and the production of the data was shaped by the place and the issues that mattered to people and how this approach helped this individual nuisance become more of a collective activity that mobilized people. Face-to-face -face work was really important for underpinning that digital activity and the process of codifying their experiences in officially recognized ways, giving voice, if you like, a recognized voice to what they were experiencing helped empower the citizens. And so maybe even in the smartest cities with the latest technologies, actually kind of old fashioned community development and involving people and we're figuring out ways to um, express issues and negotiate ways of finding ways of resolving those issues is, is really, really vital. In other words, this sort of big data has to become thick with social meaning. But as we can see in some of the ongoing issues, if you like, that's happened after this noise uh, monitoring campaign, other kinds of non-codified knowledge are just as important maybe. Maybe the knowledge, a sort of social anthropology of what's going on in the square, knowledge about young people's rights to gather and socialise in public spaces, some of the economic developments and trends that have um, made mass tourism such an important part of the, the city economy and so some of the, and, and why some of the bars and restaurants in the neighbourhood and around the square have become much more significant and important players in giving people jobs and contributing to the economy of the, the city and the neighborhood. But then also questions about who's benefiting from those activities, okay? And who's bearing some of the costs in terms of the noise. So additional knowledge about the, the, the community and local economics dynamics is really, really important as well. So innovation can empower groups, but additional strategies may be needed to develop a more sustainable pathway, if you like, a more convivial square around exercising rights and responsibilities, holding power to account, and maybe trying to get more than just a few uh, specific interventions, and trying to expand the democratic politics, if you like, the ability for people to deliberate over um, local and social conflicts over urban space. So that was our second example, if you like, and now the final few slides, um, I want to try and take a step back to that and think a little bit about um, how innovation can be approached differently, if you like. And this diagram here is trying to, in a very perhaps crude way, but just or, uh, <laughs> trying to visualise the extent and maybe draw a distinction be between some of the values and practices that are evident in the examples Adrian and I have talked about um, and contrast them with some of the assumptions and logics and values that are important to the ways of doing innovation that we saw in technological society 4.0 okay so where in farming 4.0 maybe capital accumulation material abundance intensifying the productivity of um uh, farming processes is, 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 is really important. In some of these grassroots initiatives, it's important values around commons, making practices more democratic come to the fore. Okay, so you can see how um, these initiatives suggest that they're trying to open up different spaces. Um, and as Adrian said, with the, uh, the bio left and seed swapping examples, these are networks and practice around the world. Similarly, with the, the example I talked about, there are, there are kind of sister or related citizen initiatives in other parts of the world and, and, and social, digital social innovation and monitoring and that, that are networked and are the parts of movements to try and um, cultivate these sorts of social innovations, if you like, that are different. And so these, the characteristics of these spaces, if we contrast, I mean, it's hard to say that these grassroots innovations, what we might call, I don't know, like a post automation space, much more creative, open, exploratory and experimental and collaborative ways of developing some of the technological ingredients of automation, if you like, but other technologies and practices as well. This is a very diverse space, okay, all sorts of different values, but one that perhaps very much contrasts with the main thrust of, of innovation policy and innovations for technological societies. And out of these spaces, the characteristics of these spaces and the way that innovations is practiced 
influences things like the diversity of development pathways that are conceived, explored, and that develop in societies. The characteristics of these spaces will influence the distributions within these pathways. Who gets to benefit? Who's involved? Who's, who's, whose voices are represented? Okay, whose priorities come to count and so on and so forth. And clearly that will also influence the directions that are taken. How is sustainability understood? What priorities are most important? And so on and so forth, okay? So these pathways and their sustainabilities and their unsustainabilities will also feed on the way that maybe technological affordances such as computation, communication control, feed back into the space. And you know, this is not a kind of like single linear process. These are very dynamic and um, recursive and circular sorts of activities. I'll pause there. And so Nathan, you need to. Okay, I can see. Okay, Nathan, perhaps you can uh, do the edit. Here. Hang on a minute. Sorry. Oh. Chairs just appeared. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, we're going to begin the last few minutes of the presentation now, Nathan. So. Okay, so I'm going to hand back to Adrian now for a few further reflections on. Um, these alternative spaces for different kinds of innovation. So over to you, Adrian. Yeah, so we talked about some examples um, that have been, uh, you know, experimenting with these alternatives uh, from um, local levels, but also nationally and in some cases internationally networked. Um, but they are still on the margins. I mean, they're still pretty niche in comparison to these broad narratives around um, technological society 4.0 um, but at the same time they are innovating and the way that they're experimenting is resonating with various other social movements that we've seen emerge and strengthen over the last few years you know social movements around climate uh, and transitions to low carbon economies around labor rights biodiversity gender race um, rights to the city and uh, reclaiming the commons. So they, they really resonate with some of these examples that we've been given. Um, the key uh, thing is they're pushing for institutional changes. And sometimes we see that mainstream organizations and institutions feel that pressure. And indeed, they actually want to change. But it's difficult for them to know how. It's difficult for them to get to a stage where they're working alongside uh, and in in partnership and in with the grain of the, um, the the ideas that these social movements are pushing for. So as uh, engaged academics or and indeed as policy researchers as Adrian and I are, um, is there something that we can do to help articulate the kinds of institutional reforms that might help to empower those grassroots innovation movements and those social movements to change innovation systems in ways that uh, seek and really work towards um, social justice, environmental um, considerations. And we did uh, some 10, 11 years ago now, um, engage in an international process that tried to do that. Uh, the Innovation Sustainability Development New Manifesto project uh, involved us in working with and discussing, sharing ideas uh, with a number of other research organizations, but also um, NGOs and various other stakeholders about how innovation policy and how the way we think about innovation can serve those, what we call in, in the manifesto, the three Ds, an agenda that pays much more attention to the direction of innovation rather than how fast it moves forward, uh, pays much more attention to the distributional aspects of innovation and how the costs, benefits and risks are distributed across society, but uh, also importantly, pays more attention to the diversity of forms of innovation and not just the ones that are favored by uh, um, large uh, private interests, kind that are controlling the narrative 
driving uh, these um, debates around the fourth industrial revolution, but also the alternatives to draw on different kinds of knowledge and experiment with different means, like uh, some that we've covered today. And we put forward a range of what we called areas for action. And so the first of these was around agenda setting and um, how agendas need to reflect not just uh, the desire for enhanced productivity, for um, faster, more innovation, but actually uh, this 3D agenda around um, distribution and also um, directions, directions of innovation that serve um, environmental and social goals. Um, funding also needs to move towards a, um, you know, a larger portion um, taking uh, environmental and social challenges much more seriously and seeing them as the focus rather than that of productivity. Um, capacity building. Um, this is around not only development of uh, capacity in science and technology, but actually recognizing a whole range of capabilities. As Adrian pointed to before, um, not just technical, but also um, around um, organizational um, forms and, and organizational um, innovation and organizing was the uh, fourth of our um, areas for action. That involved working across research systems, but also um, with a range of different actors, um, like the ones that we've talked about in today's lecture. And then the final um, area for action that we advocated was around monitoring, evaluation and, cap and accountability. And so in setting these agendas, these policies um, for funding and capacity building, uh, a, a much greater emphasis on directions, distribution and diversity in the way that the um, outcomes were actually evaluated. And indeed, much more accountability being placed on public and private actors for the way that they were innovating and for the um, values that drove that innovation and the outcomes that emerged. So you can see um, more information about the manifesto at the link uh, at the bottom of the slide, um, but I'll just hand back to Adrian to, to finish up. Great, thanks. Well, that's where we conclude really. I just want to kind of recap what we've covered and um, thank you all for sticking with us and making it to the end of the recording. We began by talking about, if you like, the dominant pathways uh, through which innovations conceived and shaped uh, around what we call technological society 4.0. And we recognize that's really powerfully situated politically and economically. These visions promoted by organizations like the World Economic Forum, a lot of the multilateral agencies, OECD, United Nations are all very much um, invested in these visions. Okay, and so they will develop. And these they, they will strengthen these institutional commitments to things like capital accumulation, labor productivity, managerial control, you know, racing along what are seen as universal technological frontiers, okay, and figuring out how different nations and communities around the world can catch up with, keep up with, or benefit in some way from those developments. But we also suggested that maybe that's quite a conservative way of looking at things for all this innovativeness. And that this emphasis on automation, technology society 4.0, these, these visions and imaginaries are actually quite powerful kind of present tense technology because they don't really transform the underlying um, social relations and structures that determine who gets to play or participate in innovation, who gets to benefit from it, who gets to shape it, and who gets to open up and experiment with our futures. So we were interested, we gave some examples and we talked a bit about kind of the grassroots spaces that may indicate alternative possibilities or not necessarily alternatives in the sense of um, they're going to displace and become the new dominant vision. Rather, we mean alternative in, in the way that Adrian was just saying about opening up diversity, having a diverse range of practices, maybe kind of thinking these as more post-automation pathways because they are getting beyond some of the assumptions and commitments and foundations of, of technological society 4.0. But that begs 
all sorts of questions, as Adrian was just alluding to. So how can grassroots activity be elevated from below the radar of innovation institutions and become more visible or engaged in some of the discussions around institutional developments and reforms and how to support innovation in, in the ways that we discuss in the new manifesto? How can these new innovation institutions support diverse grassroots spaces? And how can the, the rules of the game for innovation be, be transformed? Um, if you want to learn more about the research underpinning this, there's um, the, the link here at the very bottom takes you to varieties, a, a broader range of case studies and, and, and blogs and materials to explore some of those sorts of questions. But for now, um, from Adrian and myself, just say thanks very much. I hope you found this um, recording and lecture helpful. Um, and yeah, thanks for your attention. Thanks for that.